In the spring of my final college year, life seemed perfect. Kelly and I, college sweethearts, reveled in our plans for a bright future together. But a party, six weeks before graduation, sowed the first seed of doubt. Amidst the laughter and music, a whispered conversation caught my attention. You and Bob are great, but isn't it boring being so faithful? A friend teased. Kelly's hesitant laugh, a sound I'd never forget, haunted me. Well, life's full of surprises, she responded, her voice a mixture of defiance and guilt. This is my unraveling. Enjoy watching it. Late April in Pennsylvania can be challenging to anticipate. This April was exceptionally rainy and warm. Normally, I would need to mow my lawn for the first time in early to mid-May, but not this year. At least it's not snowing. Last year around this time, there was a snowstorm that dumped 15 millimeters on the area. I think having to mow the grass early is worth being grateful for the lack of snow. And tax season is finished. It was good to get out in the sunshine. My house is an intriguing feature. The backyard falls steeply downward, leading to a tiny brook and woods behind us. When they erected the house, they leveled the front with the road using backfill. This entailed a high incline about halfway up the side of the home. As a result, the basement, which had been totally closed in the front, ended up in the back. This allowed me to add a double-leaf service door, allowing me to store my lawnmower and other lawn items inside rather than cluttering up the garage. This was one of my favorite aspects of the house. I'm finished putting the mower in. Everything is in its proper place. I'm allergic to grass, so I couldn't wait to go upstairs and shower. I was about to reach the top step when I heard my wife's voice while mowing in front of the home. I had seen a friend's automobile, so hearing conversations did not surprise me. But as I heard what they were saying, my hand paused as they reached for the doorknob. I guess I should begin by introducing myself. My name is Robert Crane. I prefer the name Bob, but at school they dubbed me Hogan after the actor Robert Crane, who featured in Hogan's Heroes. I didn't mind, but the show aired before I was born, so it's no longer relevant as a pop culture reference. When I graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in accounting, my name remained Hogan. After graduation, I received my CPA degree in the lowest period of time possible, and I'm now working as a team leader for a large firm in Philadelphia, performing audits and other tasks. It's not the most fascinating employment, but it pays well and allows me to view the inner workings of numerous businesses. I have a specific talent for forensic analytics, which involves creating financial trials to explore topics like fraud and money laundering. I'm considered an expert, and the FBI has even requested me to counsel them on two cases. Kelly, my wife, was a political science and business major who planned to go to law school when we met in her freshman year. She stepped in as I was waiting for the first day of classes. Kelly had a tall, slim body similar to a ballerina, but with somewhat larger breasts. Her long, strawberry blonde hair cascading loosely over bare shoulders was a stunning sight, as were her pure sundress and sandals, which highlighted her amazing legs that were smooth and elastic. The combination of innocence and eroticism was too overwhelming. I was struck with instant lust. Unfortunately, Kelly was not seated next to me, and she was not allocated to my group project. It took me four weeks to approach her and begin the conversation. I cracked a ridiculous joke, and she laughed. It wasn't an elegant giggle, but a full-throated laugh. We began conversing, and I asked if she wanted to have coffee after class. I've been waiting for your query for four weeks now. She responded with a smile. We were rarely separated throughout our final two years of college. Our folks weren't pleased. But during our final year, we moved in together. They recognized our devotion to each other and accepted it. I couldn't see how things could get much better, but that is exactly what happened. After graduating from university, I went straight to work for one of Philadelphia's top accounting firms. I was making a ridiculous amount of money for a 22-year-old who had recently graduated. Kelly was accepted to the University of Pennsylvania Law School, so we stayed in our student apartment. My firm promised to pay for my MBA degree, so I also enrolled in classes. I rode SEPTA to work every day, eliminating the need for a car and saving money. Kelly graduated from university three years later, and I proposed to her at a birthday dinner at Morton's Steakhouse in Rittenhouse Square. Six months later, we married. Kelly accepted a position as a deputy district attorney for the Bucks County District Attorney's Office located north of Philadelphia. 
we opted to buy a house in Doylestown, which was the county seat and featured a courthouse. The regional rail line also stopped there, allowing me to get to work by train every day. It was an 80-minute one-way commute, but it was preferable to driving on the school freeway or Interstate 95. Kelly and her mother managed to find a place to live. It was an ideal starter home with three bedrooms. One bedroom was set up as an office, complete with two workstations. I sometimes work from home, and Kelly required her own area for legal work. The second bedroom will serve as a guest room. The final room will be our master bedroom. It was also near her parents' house. Kelly persuaded me that there was a built-in nanny option. We once had children. I grew up as an only child and wished for siblings. Kelly and I had discussed having children since freshman year, and we agreed to wait until Kelly was established in her career before we started trying. However, we reached this position two nights ago. We agreed to discontinue Kelly's birth control and begin trying for a baby. I was happier than ever before. Then I heard something that caused my hand to linger on the doorknob. Hogan and I agreed that it was time for me to get pregnant. Kelly exclaimed enthusiastically. This thrilled her buddy Olivia Watkins. Both women made the same high-frequency noise, which reminded me of whales accidentally beaching themselves off the Jersey Shore. Standing on the stairs, I grinned at their excitement, which mirrored mine. Becoming a parent. I am reaching for the pen again. I heard a question that took the grin off my face and the happiness right out of me. Olivia remarked, This is wonderful, Kelly. But what are you planning to do with P.A.? The floor? Just as Kelly was calming her pal down, Hogan is outside mowing his yard. She stated that there had been a lull, and I could almost feel her looking around for me. She then spoke again. I have already informed Paul that I am stopping the affair. He didn't care. Paul believes he has a good opportunity when Grossman takes a step down the center. Being found having an affair with a married employee would be quite uncomfortable. It really is that simple. The sentence is terminated. This is my universe. Paul Evans was Kelly's employer at the district attorney's office. He was a widower about 40 years old when his wife died of breast cancer, leaving him as a single parent to his daughter, Barbara. Paul was a true political animal, and Kelly told me stories of how he manipulated his party to seek for greater office. Looks like I just discovered how my wife gained access to all of this confidential information. Is it true? Olivia just stated that she was going cold turkey. You've been hot and serious for six months, and now you're going to give up. The taunting uncertainty in her voice made me want to cut Olivia's head apart. She was a Penn State classmate, and I knew her before Kelly. I knew Kelly and Olivia were great friends now, but I still thought she was my friend. It appears that I was wrong about this. Stop! Stop it! Kelly protested, giggling. You're really horrible! Paul is a fantastic lover, however he was difficult to play with. I adore Hogan, but Paul simply took me. He used me in whichever manner he wanted. There was no romance, only brutal sex and dominance. Now that Bob and I are having a kid, I don't want to take any chances. I adore Hogan and promise to be a loving and devoted mother. How many more cliches are we going to have here? I questioned myself. All I need to do to be entirely satisfied is return home. Find a strange car in the driveway and realize they are having sex in my bed. I wanted to run into the room and yell, destroying it. Nonetheless, my muscles were immobilized. I was astonished and unable to move. My heart was thumping in my ears. So you're going cold turkey? Olivia inquired, prompting Kelly to giggle once again. She admitted that she wasn't going cold turkey. I'll be in Pittsburgh next week for a conference with Paul. We'll throw a farewell party there. I will miss having sex. However... Hogan and the baby are far more important. I could not take it anymore. But I had no idea what to do. I adore Kelly, but this was killing me. My business education began to show results. I needed to step back and reflect, and I had to devise a strategy. I began stomping up the stairs as if I were ascending them. Then I opened the door to enter the kitchen. Kelly and Olivia sat with cups of tea in front of them. Was that a touch of remorse in Kelly's face? Are you okay, honey? She inquired, concerned. Then I noticed my cheeks were covered with tears. Allergies, I'm honored. It is going to be a dreadful spring. So go upstairs and take a shower. Simply place these garments near the bathroom and I'll wash them straight away so they don't ruin your closet. Last week I purchased a new package of Claritin D, which is now in the medical cabinet. Many thanks. I managed to say anything as I walked towards the stairs. I needed to think.
The next morning was Monday, and I used the excuse of an early meeting to get out of the house before Kelly awoke the night before. I utilized my allergies as an excuse to go to bed early because my emotions were agitated. Sitting in the carriage, I considered what I had heard. On the one hand, my wife was unfaithful, but everything ended sexually so she could stay with me and give birth to my child. Some might argue that I should keep things as they are and be content that my wife is returning to marriage with plans to be a good wife and mom. However, a voice in my head asks that if she did it once, what's stopping her from doing it again ten years later when the kids leave to school? Would she have another romantic affair, followed by a divorce with children, in which Kelly would most likely receive the children, and I, as an accountant and business analyst, will receive a large child support bill? I thought about risk and reward, and I find myself doing the same here. It got to the point where my faith in my wife was entirely eroded. What is the true issue in such circumstances that the just sex excuse fails to address? A total lack of regard for your partner. The cheater is aware that their actions are improper and are causing harm to the other person. Otherwise, they would have done it openly, and I would have known from the start. Don't get me wrong, I don't think I'd ever accept her sleeping with Paul, but at least if she told me about it, there would be some respect exhibited. Kelly's acts demonstrate how much she respects me. I was working, but part of my mind was preoccupied with what I should be doing. I have no proof other than the overheard exchange. I didn't notice anything change throughout the last six months, during which this romance appeared to continue. Direct confrontation in the absence of evidence would be high risk, with little payoff. Kelly will refute it. Paul Evans will refute it. Taking any lawsuit to court would have meant financial ruin. Evans was well known among the judges, politicians, and lawyers in the surrounding counties. I would have been buried to keep his identity clear. I considered leaving and restarting somewhere else. It seemed alluring, but the house would be like an anchor around my neck. Kelly couldn't afford it on her own salary, and we had very little equity. To prevent foreclosure, she would need to sell it almost immediately. And in today's market, that was highly implausible. It would ruin both my and her credit and reputation. Being a CPA with a poor credit history is not the ideal option when looking for a new job. How can anyone trust you with other people's money if you clearly can't manage your own? I required proof before I could take action. I would have gotten them, but they came from the most improbable source. Three days later, I kept my cool, but I still couldn't find any evidence to back up what I'd heard. Her own laptop was clean. No secret email accounts were found. There was no beautiful lingerie stashed in a box in the back of the closet. There are no receipts from locations she shouldn't have gone. There is absolutely nothing. Kelly then called me at work and invited us to a political announcement party at Paul Evans' place on Friday night. I anticipated this would be a dramatic announcement of his candidacy for a seat in the U.S. Senate. I considered a major reveal, but I lacked proof. Damn it. We came right in time for the big event. Evans owned a huge estate near Washington Crossing with a little horse farm in the backyard. A big tent was set up to accommodate all of the guests. When we stepped in, Paul Evans stood at the head of the receiving line as if he were a king. Evans, a widower, did not have a wife to play hostess to, so he clearly recruited his 21-year-old daughter for the position. She stood behind her father, greeting visitors as if she had been born to do so. When it was our turn, Evans grinned warmly at Kelly and said, Kelly, you did it. That's amazing. He gently kissed my wife on the cheek. Then he turned to face me. Robert, I'm pleased to see you again. I'd be completely lost without your wife. However, as I understand it, I will soon have to give her up once you begin to expand your family. He laughed at his own prank. There will be no hard feelings if you simply allow me to take her when you are finished with her. Laugh again. Kelly even reddened a little, and I wanted to kill this cocky fool. I got his hint, which he claimed went over my head. Who knows what the future will hold? I spoke in a flat and neutral tone. Not antagonistic, but definitely not friendly. I reported the audit findings in the same manner. Evans reddened slightly, while Kelly elbowed me and muttered something about being disrespectful. Evans moved on to the next visitor, leaving us alone with his daughter. Kelly was a stunning woman, but Barbara Evans was a vision, even in my wrath. This is something I noticed. Her auburn hair and bright smile reminded me of a younger Marilyn Monroe. 
If Kelly resembled a buster ballerina, Barbara looked like she belonged on a swimwear pinup calendar beside Kate Upton. She possessed the mix of beautiful looks, a healthy physique, hair and skin that photographers desired and frequently had to attain using Photoshop. Paul Evans had the perfect political family, complete with a triple threat. He appeared to be the perfect fit for the roles of wise politician and family guy. After losing his wife to cancer, he found the ultimate wife. She was worshipped, and anyone who challenged her was willing to commit professional suicide. Barbara was the princess prom queen, a Penn State businessman, a former gymnast, and now a Penn State cheerleader. Barbara, according to Kelly, was planning to try out for the Eagles cheerleading squad at the next open competition because she had recently turned 21 and had a saintly late wife and a clever, gorgeous, photogenic daughter. Barbara exclaimed enthusiastically, holding me hard, The press will love him on the campaign trail, Robert. This was not a friendly hug at a gathering. It was a complete body compression. Parts of her body pressed against mine in the most delightful way. You look fantastic. It's no surprise Kelly hid you. You never come to any of our parties. You shouldn't be working so hard. It's not good for your health. She managed to get all out in one breath. In less than a second, my mood shifted from wrath to total shock. I spoke a few polite things about how lovely she looked and was about to go when two thoughts occurred to me. First and foremost, Barbara never greeted Kelly. Second, what kind of gatherings are these? Kelly didn't give me a chance to question before rushing to greet the young woman. We had no choice but to make way for the next people in line, when Kelly and I went to hang out. I was curious what Barbara knew, after pouring a glass for my wife. I inquired as to which parties Barbara was discussing. Kelly only smiled and snorted dismissively. She was only taunting the brat. Paul occasionally has team meetings and strategy sessions here. He claims he thinks better with a drink in his hand and in a bar. You never know who'll be in the next booth. She was at home numerous times when we met here. Don't tell anybody. However, Paul allowed her to drink at home before she turned 21. So that got me wondering. Under the pretense of team meetings, this jerk had sex with my wife in his own home. These may even be real meetings, with Kelly being the last to go. Or maybe she left first and returned after everyone else had departed. This would keep the legal team from wondering about why Kelly constantly lingered behind to help her boss clean up the mess when his wife, Bent, and daughter were away at college. He didn't need to get a quiet hotel room. As a result, their meeting is undocumented. So Barbara attends team meetings, I inquired. Kelly dismissed the question. No, she was at home numerous times when her courses were canceled. She's merely mocking her father for partying at work. She drew my hand. Come on, honey, buy a drink for your young wife, for the next hour. Kelly never abandoned my side. We spoke with a number of her co-workers, and several individuals mentioned our plans to have a baby and how sorry they would be to miss Kelly for a while, but also how thrilled they were for us. To be honest, I felt a little humiliated. Why did everyone know about our plans? An hour later, Paul Evans summoned everyone's attention. His daughter was smiling next to him. He began by thanking everyone for attending and then announced his major campaign. Everyone expected it, yet they were nonetheless ecstatic. I observed a local newspaper publisher and one of his reporters close taking notes. I had no doubt that there would be a big story about it in tomorrow's paper. I won't bore you with the remaining party details. It would have been a nice time if my heart hadn't been broken and my mind hadn't been working overtime to figure out how to prove it. This occurred around an hour and a half after the great announcement. Margaret Williamson, the first assistant district attorney, stepped in and said Paul wanted to speak with his staff while he was still an elected person. Margaret was a senior manager who effectively ran the office. Prosecutors may be replaced every four years. But Margaret was a constant. She was a tough woman who was also well-respected in the legal field for her honesty and ethics. Kelly accepted the employment primarily for the older woman lawyer. I liked her a lot. Margaret had been married to an electrician for over 30 years, who had put her through college and now owned a major electrical contracting business. The two were dedicated to one another. I'd always thought of them as role models for Kelly and me. I apologize for stealing your wife, Hogan. Margaret made an offer. When Paul finishes campaigning, he wants to talk about the office's organization. They both left after a brief moment. 
I stepped away from the small group of other spouses still present at the meeting and went to the other side of the enormous pool which was across from the patio where the party was taking place. A wicker swing chair hung on chains. It was in the shadows so people could see me if they looked, but I wouldn't be too obvious. In other words, it was the ideal setting for me to gather my thoughts. Now, after sitting for even five minutes, a voice broke through my stillness. So, this is where you're hiding? The voice bird. I looked up to see Barbara slide into the wicker swing next to me. She sat facing me, not saying anything. Her small black dress caressed her tanned hips, hinting at what lay beneath while remaining sexy and innocent at the same time. The fact that I noticed this almost academically says a lot about my mental condition. She said, You appear to be carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. I did not want to discuss this with my wife's lover's daughter, no matter how attractive she was. We were really busy in the office. There are numerous audits now underway. I said we should terminate the conversation. Is it true? Barbara inquired. Interested? I just finished my final accounting course at the university. We gave various courses on the application of forensic accounting in law enforcement. I felt it was incredibly exciting. Even in my anguish, I answered incredulously. It's not romantic or anything, but it is a detective's job to gather all of the proper pieces of information from a slew of different data and piece them together to build a whole picture. Furthermore, some people attempt to conceal this information, making things even more difficult. I admitted that the majority of people do not believe this. Barbara continued to describe in detail what she had learned in class and why she appreciated it so much. I must admit that I was impressed. I've had people end their internships at firms who couldn't talk very well on this topic. Focusing on her words helped me overcome both her appearance and, more crucially, the wrath that was bubbling deep within me. I felt fully immersed in my duty as mentor. This allowed me to shove the inner anguish to the background. Did you actually enjoy the course? I remarked. You appear to have a thorough understanding of the material. Barbara reddened briefly as I complimented her. The pinup girl vanished, and I saw a sweet girl who was truly moved by my modest compliment. After I finished school, I seriously considered joining the FBI. Dad wants me to become a prosecutor or work for one of his buddy's legal businesses. I am not sure this is what I want to do. You should pursue your own aspirations, not your father's. I made it clear that I was not opposed to derailing that freak's ambitions. I did a little work for the FBI. Before Barbara could answer, audits showed something criminal. Kelly came out of the shadows. That is where you vanished to. You did not do anything inappropriate, she inquired teasingly. Barbara smiled broadly as she turned to see my wife. We were simply chatting about Bob's work. We were just discussing it in class. I needed an expert's opinion. Kelly proudly stated, Hogan is like that. I checked at one of his audit reports and discovered that an employee embezzled money using his boss's login. Hogan noticed that some of the transfers took place while the individual was on a business trip, but the login was done from the corporate office. The majority of us would have stopped when the boss was identified. Hogan resumed digging. I might have obtained a conviction against this employee on the first day of law school. Hogan departed to prosecute others who had nothing to do with the case. Kelly looked at me proudly as she told me this small story. This utterly perplexed me. How could she be proud of me and say she loved me when she was in a six-month relationship with her damn boss? Kelly questioned what occurred, so there must have been some bewilderment on my face. Dear? Nothing, I responded. I was just thinking about the situation. Okay, stop it, Kelly admonished me. It is a party. She barely regained her breath before saying... Hogan, you'll never guess what opportunity one was given. Paul and Margaret want me to undertake some administrative work because I plan to go on maternity leave as soon as your job is completed. This way, when I depart, there will be no hanging stuff. I will work directly for Margaret. Something in my heart skipped a beat at the notion of Kelly being separated from that jerk Paul a second later. My hopes had been dashed. I'll have to travel occasionally, Kelly continued. I'll be delivering vital paperwork to Paul throughout the campaign so I won't be active in it, but I'll be able to watch some of the behind-the-scenes action. This will be so much fun. I felt my heart break again. I understand. I heard Kelly say she wants to end the affair so we can have a baby. However, I can readily imagine her being unfaithful again in preparation for the campaign trail. Who is to tell that if she becomes pregnant, the child will be mine? 
Paul is around my size and color. Without a DNA test, this would be extremely difficult to ascertain. My fury began to swell, but I contained it. This is not the time. Barbara began speaking with Kelly about her new position in the campaign. They quickly became engaged in conversation, and I was forgotten. I took advantage of the chance to gather my thoughts. After tonight, I will begin planning. I needed to offset Paul's political power. However, to be honest, I had no idea how to accomplish it. Two days later, the answer arrived at my office. Your meeting at four o'clock is already scheduled. My administrator called through the open door. I checked my Outlook calendar and found nothing booked. Before I could respond, she entered. Barbara Evans. Hello, Hogan. She greeted as she arrived, her beautiful auburn hair flowing over her shoulders, a pure light sundress that highlighted her stunning legs, and strappy sandals that embraced her legs almost like a release. Her breasts were decently covered and had little cleavage, yet the cloth rubbed against her chest in a seductive way. Two thin straps held up the outfit, leaving her arms exposed. I was speechless as I watched her arrive. I hope you do not mind, Barbara began. She shut the office door behind her. I informed Mary that we had a meeting to discuss my career and Kelly's employment with my father. As she entered, I politely rose from my chair. I'm glad to see you. I was just working on some reports, as I indicated, and motioned for her to take a seat in front of my table. After she had settled in, I joined her. What would you like to chat about? Barbara's countenance changed abruptly, her former contentment fading. I believe you know, Bob. I could see it on your face when you spoke to my father, she said. I'm truly sorry. He is generating difficulties. He's a good person, I replied, taken aback. This was not what I expected. What exactly are you talking about? I asked cautiously. Barbara did not mince words. Is my father having an affair with your wife? She spoke bluntly. I leaned back in my chair, surprised by the directness. Have you found out recently? Barbara inquired quietly. I nodded. I'm truly sorry. How? When did you find out? I inquired around three months ago, Barbara admitted. I'm not sure when it started, but I found out in February. I arrived home early one Friday and found them in her jacuzzi. I photographed and recorded them sprinting naked into the house. There was a solid foot of snow on the ground, Barbara confessed. My shock was apparent. Did you snap photographs of your father in that situation? I asked incredulously. Can I receive copies? I added quickly, contemplating its possible use in a divorce. Barbara reached inside her bag and produced a huge envelope. She said she had images from that day and several more. Dad installed the security system in the home. The entire facade is covered and some inner rooms are equipped with cameras. Stunned by this revelation, I realized Paul's daughter had done all required to end her father's marriage. Why? I inquired, hoping to understand her motivations. Barbara's melancholy expression turned to wrath because I despise him more than you ever could. She spit out. I stay silent, allowing her to continue. Dad met Mom while she was a college student. He was an ambitious lawyer assigned to Philadelphia's sex crimes unit. Barbara mentioned her mom came to study from Ireland. Her wealthy family was killed in the bombing of Londonderry. She came here to escape the tumult. Her voice softened as she recalled the past. Mom was involved with a person who ended up putting her in intensive care because of his aggression. Kelly paused and set the perfect book on my table, covered with greenery and lace. I discovered her diaries after she passed away. She had a preference for being submissive in relationships, relishing the domination of a powerful partner. This guy took things too far. She ended up in the hospital. My father was assigned to the case. They met. He went to jail, and a year later they married. My father was always ambitious. He discovered a brilliant, beautiful woman with an exotic accent, whilst mom found a guardian. Barbara explained, I came along a few years later. Dad encouraged me to pursue gymnastics, believing that an Olympic-bound daughter would help his political career. Do you know how most gymnastic careers end? I shake my head. I never considered it. I responded. Barbara smiled. They call it the three Bs, or boobs butts in, boys. I received the first one. I was pushed into cheerleading, supposed to be the All-American gal. I did not mind. I enjoyed performing. However, by the age of 16, I realized I was merely a pawn in my father's goals. Mom was aware of the situation fairly immediately. Dad had affairs from the get-go. Mom implored with him to stop, but she was too weak to act. Divorce was not an option for her because she is a devout Catholic. 
Barbara paused to gather her thoughts. Sometimes I wonder if her poor response to cancer therapy was a subconscious desire to die or a deliberate attempt to sabotage it. Anyway, I was with her at the hospital when she died. The official explanation is that my father went to court and won a murder case, causing the doctor to modify the time of death. In truth, he celebrated by having sex with his assistant in her flat and giving my mother with a trophy. The press made up the tale of how they met a great prosecutor who saved a beaten woman. But I observed him beating her more than once. Why are you telling me all of this? I inquired, feeling driven to know. You deserve to know. Hogan, my father, is not a good man. After my mother died, he handled his business until I departed for college. Then he started organizing gatherings in the house, not only for business but also for some of the charitable organizations he supports. I know for certain that he sleeps with two other ladies from these gatherings. One of the poor women believes it's pure love and intends to leave her husband. Is this what Kelly is thinking of doing? I asked. I understood what I had heard but remained interested. Barbara shakes her head. She thinks it's just fun. They claim that power is the primary aphrodisiac. Kelly appears to be proof of that. I overheard or spoke to my father about a senator they were meeting with. So what do you want? I inquired. To her credit. Barbara responded by looking me directly in the eye. I want you to end your marriage with this traitor. I want to damage my father's career to the point that he will never be elected dog catcher in a town full of cats. I believe that together we can make them pay. Isn't it more difficult for you to finish school? I asked the question. Did she fling her auburn hair? No. My mother left me her inheritance as a trust fund. I did not touch it. But if it came down to it, I could pay for the remainder of my education and an MBA while still having a decent buffer. If your mother had so much money, why didn't she take you and leave? I advised that she travel to Ireland where your father could not. Barbara grimaced. She was reared as an Irish Catholic. She was taught that divorce was not an option, regardless of the circumstances. My mother remained committed to her beliefs till the end. This is the only reason I believe she died unintentionally. Because they too consider suicide to be an unforgivable act, I confess to seeing nothing but truth in Barbara. She added that she wanted to harm her father's career because knowing I possessed this information did not bode good for his objectives. I didn't think it was a trap. If Kelly and Paul intended to destroy me, they could do so openly in court. This suggests the strategy was intended for people who were desperate, like me. A plan began to form in my mind, I need Barbara's assistance with a few tasks. If nothing else, it would demonstrate how determined she was to destroy her father. Okay, I agree. But I don't want to hurt him by publicizing these photos or even mentioning him in the divorce. Barbara glanced at me with surprise. Why not? She demanded, her face flushed with emotion as she prepared to deliver a speech. I stopped her with a raised hand. I didn't say we wouldn't ruin him, but I don't want to deal with the negative publicity surrounding a cuckolded husband in a political controversy. Instead, I want to undermine what he has worked for his entire life, power and influence, and I can have a nice, peaceful divorce with no one to worry about. Barbara's expression was one of disbelief as she glanced at me. A minute later, a cheeky smirk emerged. What do you want from me? She asked. I am going to do what I do best, Give me all of his personal and campaign financial information. They apprehended Capone due of tax evasion. After meeting your father, I'm confident that I can locate something. And if not, I smiled. I can do one more item during the next three days. Barbara and I were both busy. She set up a keystroke recorder on her father's personal laptop and home PC. She also performed a complete backup of his computer's hard disk. We set up their security system to transfer records to a cloud storage facility that I am familiar with that is physically situated abroad. I did not use Bob Kelly's phone. I didn't need anything further because Barbara's evidence was sufficient. I activated a GPS tracker designed to help parents keep an eye on their children. Essentially, it employed cell towers to pinpoint the position. Unless I sent an order to turn on the GPS, I didn't want her to find me at home while I was working. The day after Barbara initially visited me, I suffered a groin injury. This offered me an excuse to not have sex with my wife. After discovering about Paul's companions, I didn't want to take any more chances than I had unintentionally taken. Furthermore, I didn't believe I could have done it without my fury erupting. 
By the way, I scheduled an appointment with the doctor to be tested for sexually transmitted illnesses. Nothing was found at first, but some infections, such as HIV, might take months to test positive for antibodies. Kelly went to the convention in Pittsburgh for one last date with Paul. Annoyed and upset, it's no surprise that she was so eager about the vacation. My trouble was that deep down I still loved her. I wouldn't be able to trust her again. But that didn't mean I stopped loving her. But I couldn't bear the thought of having sex with her after what I discovered. Kelly, her luggage packed, was waiting for Paul and their office's junior lawyer, who was accompanying them to the conference. So I'll be home on Sunday afternoon. Kelly came up to me after dumping her suitcase at the front door. I sat at the table with my back to her, sipping my coffee. She placed her arms around me and leaned down, her lips next to my ear. I hope you feel well so we can start caring for the baby, she whispered, her voice holding enough weight to raise the dead, transporting me back to more innocent times. I wanted to cry right there, but I managed to keep my emotions in check in order to help it recover. I assured her, stroking her hand and kissing her forehead, which sparkled. I wish I did not have to go. It would be so much better to stay at home with you and spend the weekend naked. You can always inform Evans that something more pressing has come up. I indicated that the words slipped out accidentally. By the way, she was looking at me. She saw something in my tone. What's the problem with Paul? She inquired in amazement. You were unpleasant at the party and now you talk like you despise this individual. I forced myself to relax and shrugged. To be honest, I've seen far too many hot-headed jerks like Evans who believe he is untouchable and the embodiment of authority. They're large fish in a little pond, peddling the illusion of power and compelling people to believe in it. Last year, for example, a powerful mayor in South Carolina embezzled the city's funds despite having three wives. He is now serving a ten-year sentence in federal prison, and they are all divorced and publicly humiliated. Evans gives me the impression that if he gets to Washington in a week... He'll be seducing inexperienced interns, but ultimately his car's wheels will fall off, and when that happens, I don't want a motel nearby. Kelly glanced at me in disbelief. She had heard me talk about those kinds before, but I had never associated Evans with them. I probably should have kept my mouth shut, but it felt wonderful to let it out. Although the marriage had ended, I felt it was only right to warn Kelly. I still loved her, even though I'd never trust her again. Hogan. That is dreadful. What you stated about Paul Kelly sparked protest. He is a terrific individual who has done a lot for the residents of this district. He is not like that. Her denial had an almost begging tone to it, which was unexpected. We heard a car honk outside our house. Paul has come. Kelly sent out a disappointed groan. He gave me a gaze that rapidly changed into one of regret and fear. I will be home in four days. Kelly said something conciliatory. We can discuss it then, but be ready, love. We have a child to begin with. She then placed her arms around me and gave me a passionate kiss. I replied with an equally passionate kiss. Have a lovely week, she breathed. I love you. I said, I love you too. She picked up her purse and opened the front door. Goodbye, sweetie, she called over her shoulder. Goodbye, Kelly, I replied. I then closed the door. Thirty minutes later, I boarded a train towards the city. Barbara and I had an appointment with the FBI. It turned out that I didn't have to prepare any evidence. I would evaluate Paul Evans's embezzlement abilities as moderately intelligent. Barbara and I met at her off-campus flat to go over the documents she had taken from his computer. Overall, the procedures are relatively conventional. I guessed he had around $2 million stowed away in an offshore account. At least that is what he transferred— but I couldn't be certain it was still present because those records were not included. A large portion of this money came from tiny donors who would not arouse IRS suspicions. But why were people from out of state contributing to the DA's campaign? I was able to connect some of them to prisoners whose cases were dismissed or who entered into plea bargains with exceptionally light terms. Barbara discovered the biggest bomb. It turned out she wasn't the only child. Along the way... Evans fathered two additional children. One of them was born three years before the death of his spouse. His mother was one of his employees at the time. An 18-year-old volunteer at the hospital where his wife was being treated gave birth to their third child eight months after her death. 
Evans paid each woman $2,000 per month in campaign contributions as poll research consultants. Barbara was so angry that she nearly wrecked her own flat. That crimson hair was a real warning. By the time Kelly and Paul left, we had gone over everything in Paul's notes. Questions remained, but we lacked the resources to obtain the information. So I documented all of my observations and scheduled a meeting with the senior FBI agent I worked with in the Philadelphia office. Barbara arrived to give them the story we'd made up. Barbara stated that after taking a forensic accounting course, she wanted to examine actual records. She decided to read over her father's notes out of innocent curiosity. She noticed some unusual things. She called me since my wife worked for her father and was aware of my experience. Gary was a seasoned pro. He realized there was more to it. But we dropped a gift-wrapped present in his lap so he didn't press the matter. A corrupt prosecutor in his own backyard a shady prosecutor who recently began a campaign for the United States, Senate. This career-making opportunity seemed like mana from heaven. We took a taxi to Barbara's flat because she had a late lesson while I walked to the 30th Street station to catch the train home. I considered packing my belongings and leaving when Kelly arrived home. Gary assured the case that he would at least subpoena Evans' records by Wednesday. It is unlikely that much time will pass before news of the probe gets public. When the rats leave the ship, the bastard will realize how unreal his authority is. Kelly called while I was riding the train home. She said that she called early since they were going to have dinner and it would be extremely late before she returned to her room. I had no doubt she had no intention of staying in a room tonight. I made some imprecise remarks implying that everything was okay. She saw my disturbed demeanor and inquired as to what was wrong. I just met with some FBI agents regarding something. I said, I am in the carriage. Furthermore, the inquiry is still continuing. Therefore, I cannot discuss anything. All of this was absolutely true. Kelly expressed concern. It appears that it has really affected you. Yes, this case will be disastrous. When the complete tale becomes public, it may make national headlines, I replied, a little interested. Can you offer me a hint? Kelly asked. I couldn't resist. Corrupt politicians, bribery, money laundering, prostitution, and adultery. Children, any of my friends. I darkened. I have already talked too much. If I say anything else, the Bureau will silence me. Kelly pouted. You're no fun. Do not worry, love. Your secret is safe with me. We said farewell, and she turned off. When I entered the house, everything amazed me. My marriage was over. We dated and got married. We were together for ten years. I never anticipated to be single again. But that's exactly what I was going to do. Finally, I sat on the couch and waited for the sun to set. I felt as if I was watching my life fade into the horizon. I was simply watching. I didn't move again until several hours after dusk. It was midday on Saturday when I snapped out of my self-pity fit. I'm not saying I didn't deserve some slack but I realized I needed to change things up. Ironically, I was mowing the lawn again when I noticed a BMW convertible drive into my driveway. I paused the mower and watched Barbara get out of her car. The first thing I noticed was her long, pale legs protruding from the driver's side. She was once again wearing sandals with thin cords that wrapped around her calves. They always reminded me of the ancient Greeks. And she stepped outside. I noticed her sculpted legs move, indicating strength beneath her solid skin, in keeping with the Greek style. She wore a pure white toga-like garment that terminated mid-thigh, with five centimeters of lace at the bottom, revealing her upper face. The dress was constructed of a soft, silky material designed to fit her curves and be semi-sheer. Her lovely breasts were supported by a bikini top that showed through her dress. Her arms were bare save for the light freckles that speckled her upper arms and shoulders, the garment only went down one shoulder, leaving the other exposed. Long red hair flowed in waves on the same shoulder. However, her gray-green eyes and smile drew my attention as she approached me. I shut off the engine and met her. Well, Barbara responded, you look better than I expected. I had not expected to have to get you out of the bottle or off the ledge. I snorted. Last night I had many ideas about both alternatives. We have to do this, I explained. Furthermore, it distracts me. Have you ever met with a lawyer? She asked. I shrugged. I completed it on Tuesday before they departed. The documents will be ready by Monday. I agreed to order the client in Austin and depart on Tuesday. 
Typically, such business travels last three days, after which I work remotely until the report is completed. In this instance, I'll be there for the full three weeks. I shrugged again. This is definitely a coward's way out, but I don't want to be present when all of this chaos begins. Barbara's expression indicated agreement. She knew this would draw attention to her as the bastard's daughter. I'm delighted you're thinking forward. The redhead spoke, but I realize you're good at this. That smile again. Now I can plan, too. Okay, this is my plan, Barbara announced. I'll assist you finish your work here, and then you can come to me. We'll have fun. You'll even be able to give me a wild look. I have a swimwear that you will love. I attempt to cheer up. Barbara, I am still married. I resisted, and I doubt I'll be prepared for anything for a while. The hot redhead advised, You need to let off some steam before you explode. Furthermore, as the adage goes, What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Her glance was simultaneously humorous, sly, and callous. It was a strange twist of fate that left me baffled and amused. After wrapping up chores in my backyard, I cleaned up and headed out with Barbara for a late lunch at a quaint diner. The thought of seeking revenge through a fleeting romance wasn't appealing, but stepping out for a bit seemed like a good idea, especially with someone as sweet as Barbara. As we neared the diner, I caught sight of a car that stood out. It belonged to Olivia. I almost suggested to Barbara that we head elsewhere, but something inside me clicked, pushing me to act out of character. It was an impulse move. Despite my usual penchant for careful planning, I found myself embracing this sudden urge. Spotting Olivia's car in the parking lot, I took it as a sign. With a casual arm around Barbara, we entered the diner. There, I discreetly slipped the owner some money to ensure we got a specific table. It was partially hidden, yet had a clear view from one particular angle. I settled Barbara in a spot where she could be seen and took my seat beside her. As we held hands, she flashed me a sweet smile, as if she knew something I didn't, but I wasn't complaining. I shared a laugh with her about how I discovered my wife's betrayal and mentioned Olivia's car outside. Barbara's laughter was infectious. She joked about being the other woman and with a tender kiss, set a playful tone to our lunch. Our meal was delightful, filled with Barbara's sharp wit and laughter. However, things took a surprising turn when Olivia passed by, catching us in an intimate moment. Her shock and outrage filled the diner as she confronted me, accusing me of infidelity while my wife was away. I retorted with calm indifference, revealing my awareness of my wife's unfaithfulness and pointing out the irony in Olivia's accusations. The confrontation escalated quickly, with Olivia in disbelief over my revelations. I subtly prodded her for confirmation about my wife's actions, which she inadvertently provided. With that, I advised her to leave, and soon after she hastily exited the diner, visibly shaken. Barbara mused on the encounter with a chuckle, wishing it had lasted longer. Yet she pointed out the inevitable. Olivia was likely informing my wife about the lunch. Given the distance my wife had to travel back, we deduced we had ample time for dessert and for me to make necessary arrangements before facing the consequences. Regrettably, my plans to see Barbara in a more casual setting seemed dashed, but she hinted at a future visit, sparking a silver lining amidst the chaos. Shortly after, my phone was bombarded with angry messages from my wife, accusing me of betrayal. The irony made me consider the situation with a hint of amusement. I proceeded to disconnect from the drama, focusing instead on packing and planning my departure. In the end, I found solace in making arrangements for a new start, leaving my past behind. Barbara and I continued our conversations, contemplating what lay ahead as I relocated. Despite the turmoil, the thought of moving on brought a sense of peace and anticipation for a fresh beginning. The loud cries from Olivia got many people's heads turned. Then someone put a sharp note on their webpage calling out Barbara Indie Gamers. My words about Kelly enjoying time with Paul also got shared, along with news of them being in Pittsburgh together for the weekend. This sparked a big fuss in the county's politics and at the court all week. I kept away from the news in Philadelphia. It wasn't until Friday that I got a letter telling me about the drama in Doylestown. To my surprise, it was from Margaret, the head worker at the DA's office. The older lawyer said sorry for all the mess. She knew Paul was seeing other women outside work, but was clueless about Kelly being involved. She also gave me a pat on the back for using law to hit back at the lawyer. 
What a wild week it was at the DA's office. Margaret shared that Paul came to work on Monday morning trying to clear the air and deny any wrongdoing. He tried to spin it as just his daughter acting out due to her cheating husband. Then on Tuesday, Kelly got hit with divorce papers for being unfaithful. Inside were photos, DVDs, and my letter to her. When Kelly read my letter, she screamed, making Margaret and two others rush to her office. Kelly sat in shock, and Margaret saw the photos from my letter strewn on the table. In my letter, I told her I wasn't having an affair, but hoped she now understood my pain because of her actions. I said I couldn't stay married to someone I couldn't trust, more so now that I knew she had been unfaithful before. The DA's office was quiet that Tuesday. The next day, while Margaret was in a meeting with Paul, four men in suits walked in suddenly. Paul was mad at the interruption until one of the men announced he was being arrested. Margaret said he looked totally shocked when he was handcuffed and led out of the office. They walked him past the front door of the courthouse, right by reporters who had been tipped off, I suppose. A beer is needed for this, I agree. Ending her letter, Margaret said sorry for letting such behavior slide in her office. She also told me to reach out if I needed anything because I didn't deserve such treatment. I think her letter was partly about trying to fix things. But mainly, I believe Margaret is as upright and professional as I always thought she was. My hope for a quiet divorce was blown up by my own dumb joke with Olivia at that restaurant. News channels in Philadelphia quickly picked up on Paul's arrest and the charges against him. Like I told Kelly, our story had all the bits of a summer romance. Love, betrayal, revenge, and plenty of anger. The media ate it up, and it was everywhere in no time. I dodged the worst of it because I was out of town and had booked a second hotel room far from the one my work knew about. But I checked in there, and reporters were waiting, trying to find me. I saw on TV they camped outside my house. Kelly stayed inside, and they only saw my relatives. Barbara had it tough being seen as the daughter who turned on her dad. She still had to attend classes and exams, so for a few days it was easy for the media to locate her. The school then made the reporters leave since they were bothering the students. It helped, too, that two other women who had kids with Paul came forward, wanting their moment in the spotlight. With that, Barbara slipped away to the airport. The media was bummed but not shocked when she missed her graduation ceremony. Soon, this story turned into just another news piece. It heated up again when Paul's trial started, but he admitted to several charges, which meant he was now staying with the federal government for 20 years. Luckily, his guilty plea meant Barbara and I didn't have to speak in court. Then the case fell off the media's radar, taking Barbara, Kelly, and me with it. Strangely, after all the public fuss, my divorce wrapped up quickly and without much trouble. Kelly signed the papers just four days after getting them. She sent back a letter saying, Sorry, and how wrong she was. Coming back from Pittsburgh, she was furious, swearing never to forgive me for turning on her. Realizing she was the only one who cheated made her see her own mistakes. She agreed to an even split and asked for a meetup when things cooled down to say sorry face to face. At the end, she said she'd always love me and wished me luck. Later, I heard from her mom that she left her job and moved to the Midwest to live with her aunt. Nailing Paul was a big plus for my career. The FBI tipped their hats to me for breaking down Paul's tapes while I was avoiding the press. I got even more into my work in Austin, finding not only one crook they were after, but a second unknown one. My company gave me a bump up and made me head of the fraud team. And yes, some wise guy named our team Hogan's Heroes. The best bit was getting a recent grad as my helper, eager to learn about forensic accounting. I've never enjoyed working late so much in this bikini looked even better on the floor of my hotel room after the shock of finding out about Kelly's cheating which flipped my world upside down I'm left sitting in a quiet house that we once shared now just a space filled with the echoes of a life I thought was real Kelly's affair the slow picking apart of truths and our marriage breaking down forced me into a sea of mixed feelings making me deal with betrayal anger and a deep need for answers now in the quiet that's become my only friend, I'm dealing with so many emotions. There's a strong anger in me for the lies I found, but also a sad longing for the love we had, now dirty and lost in the lies. Even with all the mess, part of me still wants to know why Kelly left the path we made together, dreaming as one. Thinking alone at night, the future looks like a big, unknown sea. 
The silence of our home, once full of our happiness and dreams, now shows my alone time. But even in this deep, sad spot, a small hope lights up, breaking through the dark with the chance of a new start. I'm facing the big job of rebuilding, not just what's around me, but who I am. The betrayal, tough as it is, has weirdly made me look at myself and grow. It's in this hard time of pain that I find the power to ask questions, to rethink what really matters. The hunt for a true bond, based on trust, respect, and a love that asks for nothing in return, calls out to me. Looking forward, I see the marks left on my heart, the signs of the storm that went through my life. But I also see the strength that started to grow in me. Life, with all its surprises, gives me a blank page to start fresh, to make a fate that shows my true self, free from the past's hurts. As I walk into the unknown, I take with me the lessons from the ruins of my old life. The road to getting better and finding myself again is full of hard steps, but I'm ready with a new will. The betrayal hasn't shaped me. Rather, it has made a stronger, more aware me, open to what comes next. In this new start, I've come to see that while the betrayal broke the world I knew, it also showed the strong base I can build on. A future that, though not sure, is mine to make with the knowledge from the hurts of the past. This isn't just the close of a chapter filled with lies, but the start of a new story, written with the pen of being strong and the hope for tomorrow. Hey listeners, if you enjoyed watching this video and want to stay updated with our latest content, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. You won't want to miss out on what's coming next. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video with Queen Cheating Tales.